Hello boys and girls. So first things first, the title is of course just clickbait, um, but nevertheless in this video we're going to learn a lot about artificial intelligence in the guise of neural networks. And in particular we are going to write a program that learns to recognize handwritten digits, human written digits. Um, and so we will have a tool at hand to which we can pass small images of handwritten uh, numbers and it will make guesses about uh, what uh, digits it sees. Um, so I will start this by actually running the complete completed code. Um, so first um, you will see an ST version of the kind of digits that we can feed the network um, and then it will start learning. So okay first this is an example of this uh, image this is uh, 28 by 28 uh, pixels and so when I run the program it starts to learn what digits look like in four epochs. So there is an underlying data set of 50,000 images. And then uh, optionally, we check on a test data set how well it is trained. So we feed it uh, 10,000 images. And here you see how it improves learning the, uh, this to recognize it. So uh, in the second epoch, it recognizes about 83% uh, of the uh, images. So eight out of 10 uh, images are uh, like recognized correctly. And at the end, uh, I also give it some test images and uh, see what it does. So for example, here I pass it a seven, as you can see, this is, this is uh, a seven, it's a handwritten image of a seven translated to this SC image. And um, to the data set, the ground truth is available. And in this case, the learned neural network predicts that this is a, a zero. So it's actually wrong, right? So only 80% or 83% of the guesses will uh, typically, typically be correct. So this is a, an incorrect one. Here we have uh, uh, two and the neural network after learning guesses it correctly. Here's a three, uh, guesses it correctly. Having played around with this neural net a little bit, uh, the frees are always, always uh, guessed correctly. The, so here's another free guessed correctly. Here's a four guessed correctly. Here is a seven and strangely thinks it's an eight. Um, also, this is all stochastic, so I, I can rerun it and it will try to learn it again from scratch. Um, So it starts learning again in these four epochs. Yeah, and um, so, you know, it's stochastic. So the, the starting uh, values are always different here. He already starts with 90% and then exceeds. When I run this particular example, typically like it's, it's like, 93% correct. So this is a typical level of correctness. Here we saw that in, in this epoch it didn't improve learning the test images. Um, but here in the second run we see that actually uh, it has apart from, uh, from this two which is uh, guessed to be an eight everything is correct. So um, in this video uh, we will really just use raw Python to code up this algorithm. And in, in the examples I just showed you, I didn't want to, to you know, waste too much time. So I, I only give it a short learning uh, time span and I use a, a very simple architecture. So there's a lot of ways to improve upon this, but uh, you will uh, at the end of the video, hopefully understand how this works, how you can make this, the, this machine uh, understand quotes and quotes, uh, what a digit is and, and make uh, guesses that are over 80% correct. So, um, 
yeah, the whole thing uh, is based on the first third of this popular online book, Neural Networks and Deep Learning by Nielsen. I think that's a physicist and I think I started reading a book on quantum information theory uh, by this guy as well. The whole underlying uh, theory of uh, neural networks to the extent that it's understood is, I mean, it's basically statistics, um, some uh, linear algebra is necessary, some calculus is necessary. Of course, if you want to do it better, then you have to get deeper into theory. But um, also, since this is about like encoding images in the brain of the network, uh, there is also information theoretical math involved. And I would actually like to explore this maybe in a future video. So if you, somebody's interested in that, um, you can find me and I, I might I present uh, and talk about some papers I recently read on uh, like trying to to make sense out of uh, the uh, deep learning uh, on a proper mathematical basis. Um, okay, so uh, this is a short book of 200 pages or so. Um, and it also has some Python code, some Python 2 code, I think, if, we, if I scroll down to I don't know, page 25 or so. Sorry for this. Um, then here they start uh, pointing you to the Python code that is also on GitHub. And the program we're going to write today is a variation of that. So this is already a few years old. Uh, some but it translated it from Python 2 to Python 3. And the, the stuff I will um, present today are a, a, a neater, I would argue, uh, like more prettier and uh, concise version of this first neural network that is discussed in the book. So the, um, this book discusses three variations of neural networks. So the one that uh, we will call today, then some modifications to that to make uh, to improve it. I will say a word about it a little later, um, and then also make use of some um, other Python libraries. But here in this video, we're just going to use raw Python and then some NumPy for uh, matrix operations. But it's just uh, you know component-wise multiplication, matrix multiplication, and so on and so forth, so that uh, we don't have to um, play around with indices too much. But all in all, the, the whole uh, thing is from scratch. And so you, you actually get some, um, you, all every, basically everything is, uh, is visible, right? Uh, there's no, no black boxes in that sense. Um, so that's, I guess, the, the appeal of this video. Um, okay, uh, what I have to say though, what I will not uh, explain, so to speak, is some of the calculus aspects that are related to the particular neural network that we are going to uh, talk about. So here in the second chapter uh, called how uh, the back propagation algorithm works, this is basically a calculus chapter where he describes the math that is eventually implemented. So we will see some linear algebra and then some simple nonlinear functions um, wrapping around uh, these uh, multiplications and of this to to solve the problem of learning uh, the derivative has to be taken so here uh, he starts to if you scroll down so taking some some uh, derivatives and then I mean you can easily check out this book it's online yourself and there is some um, elaborations of all the steps uh, presented but basically he takes a derivative of some things and then the backpropagation algorithm amounts to applying the chain rule to a bunch of objects um, that are particular to the, the, the general network setup that we're going to discuss. And I don't want to spend too much time during the coding to explain wh uh, how, why it looks, how it looks. Um, so, but ju just to be sure if you have like, if you have in principle, I guess, if you have one year of, uh, calculus um, under your belt and some linear algebra, you, you can easily follow the explanation in the book. And here we're just, there are about 10 lines and we're just going to take them for granted. 
Um, so the images that you saw are from the so-called uh, MNIST database, so modified uh, database from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, these are these handwritten uh, digits, uh, human handwritten digits, 28 by 28 pixels. So these are images of just 700, I think, 84 pixels. And we're going to work with thousands of them. Some of them are going to be the training set on that we feed during the training uh, phase where the algorithm learns what a, a digit should look like. And the other uh, 10,000 are then those on which we can actually see how well we score. So they are all from the from the same batch and but you know each of those is a little bit different than the others. Um, and so the, the, the hope is once you learn one sort of data that you can also classify the other sort of data um, by using the same network that you where you learn this stuff. Okay, um, so as I said, there is this Python 3 version of the Python 2 code from the book. This is uh, this uh, GitHub um, repository. I will link to that in the box below. Um, what we're going to code is a variation essentially of uh, this network one. This is the, the network uh, discussed in the first third of this book. Um, so the code uh, that I, I will do is a variation of this, but a little bit slimmer, a little bit cleaner, I hope. And, um, and then the, the sequence, uh, if, you want, if you want to go back to the source material, you also need this test. What you have to download, um, before you actually run the code that we're going to uh, code now is this data set. So these are this um, 60,000 images or so. Um, and I will also uh, write or uh, rather like skip over this and just take it for granted the loader. So there, there is a, a small routine like, I don't know, in this file it's like 20 lines of, of Python code which just loads this data so that we have it and can can write the algorithm around it right it, I mean this is just some arrays of arrays of of some uh, floats and integers um, if you have a quick look at the network here there is um, there is the uh, backprop um, part so this is basically this um, th taking this derivative uh, we're going to implement something that looks uh, very similar um, to this. And what we are going to copy is basically these lines and, and these lines. These are the results of, the, of taking the derivative um, and just going to uh, show you where the sources are. And of course, you know, um, it, it might well be that during rewriting, um, I some, some uh, error or so uh, creeped into my code. I don't think it's the case because it works very well. Um, but I here just show you the place to double check if you're interested in that. Okay, um, so before I describe, like uh, I will, I will uh, talk a little bit about how the uh, how the principle works. So I, I maybe I spend ten minutes on, on it or so before I start to actually do the coding. Um, but um, let me also point out, and I will show you uh, where to search for that later. Um, that there are uh, YouTube videos by YouTuber Free Blue One Brown who did very nice animations to in words and animation describe how deep learning work, uh, works exactly based on uh, this book and this algorithm. So uh, he of course makes very nice animations and um, he has no code, but it, it, it does some spend some thirty or forty minutes on explaining what happens there with with some moving images. So. Uh, you you can also stop and, and uh, check that out first. Uh, will not be necessary because I will also talk about it a little bit or you can look at it later, but that's uh, one recommendation since it uses the same source material basically. Um, okay, yeah, so before I uh, uh, get into the architecture of the neural network, uh, I want to say that... Whoppa, stochastic... Stochastic gradient descent. So the thing that we are actually uh, going to implement, like the bulk of the code, the thing that 
that actually makes the training work is the so-called stochastic gradient descent um, algorithm. So we're just going to do this uh, network. It's going to be like 50 lines maybe. And 40 of those roughly um, are actually just going to be this pretty basic implementation of the gradient descent. Like this is basically just taking the derivative of an object and the object will be determined by the neural network. Um, and I want to say a few things about that uh, before we go to the network. So um, there is this image, I found it on some blog, um, that, that describes the purpose and roughly the function of the gradient descent. So the gradient um, is the vector which points in the direction of where whatever um, function uh, has the, the steepest increase, right? So for example, if you think of like, never mind what, what the labels here are, like if you, for example, think of a room, like this is uh, the x-axis of a room and this is the y-axis of a room and in the room there is some, some function, let's say the temperature and uh, the temperature on different spots of the room, right? These are coordinates of, of places in the room. Um, then whenever you sit on one spot, let's say you're here, then the, the temperature uh, has some value, let's say 30 degrees uh, Celsius. And in some other uh, place in the room, the temperature might be a little bit higher. Like let's say if you were to go a few centimeters uh, in, the direct, in this direction from here to here, then suddenly the temperature would be one and a half degrees higher, right? So you, here you get this kind of mountain that represents the, the temperature, the heat uh, that you will feel um, in uh, when you walk through the room. So here are cold areas, here are hot areas, another hot area, and then there's some valley between those. And the, the gradient descent um, algorithm is an, an algorithm that is used to find the basically the lowest point in, in such, a, such a field. Right? It's, it's the search for an extremum or a minimum in this case, and it works as follows. Wherever you are, it might be a an, an random initial point, let's say here, you're here on this, uh, this position, um, you test where uh, does the heat increase. So for example, if you're standing in this position, then the hot place would be going in this direction. Um, and then you actually go in the exact opposite for one step. Right, so if you would stand here, you see, oh, in this direction it gets hotter, so I actually go there, and then you do the same thing again. You see, oh, here, the the the, play, the direction in which it, go, it gets hotter is in this direction, so you go there, and so on and so forth, and and this way you always go away from where it's, it gets hotter, and you end up where it's actually cold. So you end up in this local minimum in this case, and this is also what, what's displayed here. So they start an x y coordinate there somewhere, and to see, oh, where does it get hotter? Uh, in this direction, so actually go in one step in the other direction. Where does it get hotter here? So I go here, right? So in this way, this is an algorithm to go down a valley, really. You just see, oh, well, where does it go down? And then you just go down. <laughs> um, so this is the gradient, this is the derivative, this is where it gets deeper, and descent is, you know, your descent because you go in the opposite direction of the gradient. And the this will be used um, to uh, train the network in the sense that you, in this case, it will not be the temperature, um, how hot it is, but it will actually be uh, a measure for how far away the, the prediction of the network is from the ground truth, from the actual value. So there's this, this error, or I will call it delta. And you have this delta for a lot of parameters that are open uh, a priori, like at the beginning um, of your whole network. These are going to be called weights and biases. And these are going to be hundreds uh, of, of numbers. So here we don't have x and y coordinates, no space, but we actually have a bunch of biases and, and, and weights. And we walk through the possible space of, of biases and weights, right? We, we, we tune the network. Um, and we are all, uh, uh, for each picture, we are going to test here. Yeah, given some, some weights, how uh, far off is the network from predicting it correctly. Uh, we are going to quantify that with a number. Um, and then we are going to take the, the, the gradient, the derivative of the, this error, this delta, 
with respect to the weights um, and thereby finding out how to tune the weights in which direction to, to go with all the weights so that this error actually gets lower so to go to the to the, the hopefully the bottom of uh, um, in, in, sp in the space of weights and biases with respect to the function that is the error we make and we are going to make this for a lot of pictures and in the stochastic gradient descent learning amounts to feeding a lot of images to the network and always testing this and collectively um, reducing the, the average error right basically we, we f and we do this then by uh, like so that we don't actually introduce some other bias or whatnot um, we actually randomly uh, feed the network different images and batch actually batch them together in, in some mini batches um, and an average over the batches and to find the you know to, to find the, the steps to take in this space um, and the only random aspect the only aspect where where the stochastics co comes in a stochastic aspect uh, if you will uh, is by randomizing the order in which the the images are fed and they are also fed in batches so this is just to explain the stochastic gradient descent. Okay, um, so that said, uh, once you understand that the whole algorithm is really just an implementation of this walking down um, in the in, in a space to minimize the error, uh, we can talk actually about the the how the the function this error uh, is captured. Um, how we can actually feed the network an input and how we get the, the error as an output. So what we're going to implement is a feed forward, no, feed forward neural network. Uh, this is the Wikipedia page. Um, these come in various uh, forms, um, but uh, to like give you a, um, a rough sketch, we will have a, a sequence of layers, right? So there's one, uh, in this case, blue input layer, and then a hi green hidden, uh, layer in the middle and there could also be uh, like several of these uh, hidden layers but in in our case we like the one I, I just ran now just has one hidden layer um, and then eventually an output layer and this you can see this this is a kind of graph right and the structure of those is that each um, layer that has um, a previous layer so this this uh, for this layer this is the previous layer for each node or what's called a neuron in this layer all the other uh, layers uh, or nodes of the uh, or many of the other um, neurons are connected to it right so you know th th uh, this one is connected to here two of the nodes in the previous layer and and for example, in the output layer, this one is connected to, to those two of the previous layer. They are always only connected to neurons in the last layer. And um, then the network works by inputting some sort of data. In our case, it will be an, an image. It will be pixel values in one layer. So we will like our first layer will have uh, one neuron in the first layer for every pixel. So 784 pixels that have a pixel value which is encoded as a number we will uh, put the, the these first numbers on the first layer so this is a, the so-called activation and then there will be a function um, that computes the activation in the next layer from the previous run and so on and so forth so the point is this that you have a bunch of layers after one another you input the, the data the image in our case in the first layer then there's a function which takes then some numbers that encode the, the image and with these numbers compute activations on the next layer and with these numbers on the next layer and compute uh, the numbers on the next layer and so on and so forth and then we go to the output and eventually this output will be interpreted by us as a prediction of the neural network right so you can you can see this as the input layer uh, would be like the eyes of the network and then it goes to the brain and, and the, there are some of these layers and eventually the brain makes a prediction and then the, we print out whatever the network says and that's uh, the result and we want to tune this thing in a way that the thing that we understand to be a number like the, an image of the number four um, 
is then mapped also to the output prediction. Hey, this is a four. Um, okay, and so the uh, the neural. Net, let me see if there are any more pictures. Okay, this is. There, are of course, like uh, a lot of things you can do to improve uh, upon this simple architecture. Um, but uh, in this case, the architecture that we're going to implement will look like this. It will have one input layer, one output layer, and then only one hidden layer, although I will write it in a general way that so that we can uh, extend it to any number of layers, really. Um, the input layer will, like in this picture, there are only like eight uh, neurons shown, but we will actually have, uh, like according to this, the size of the image, 784 input layers. So this will be a layer with uh, several hundreds of uh, neurons that are assigned an activation according to the image then this will be between two layers fully connected. So each uh, neuron on each uh, layer is connected to all neurons on the, on the previous layer, right? Do you see here um, all these connections? Um, and the output layer will have 10 um, neurons corresponding to the 10 possible predictions, right? Because we are just recognizing digits, digits uh, we only have like all the digits from, from zero to nine. And uh, these are the, actually the indices of the, like if you take the indices of these um, output neurons, then they also actually happen to correspond to actually to the dis, uh, dig, uh, digits that we will want to predict. So that's very convenient for computational purposes. Uh, but of course, uh, here we predict digits. You could also predict anything, um, you know, what, whether or not the image is a, a sheep, a dog, or a cat, and so on. Um, and that these are these classification tasks. And similar uh, architectures can also be used to do other things, like generating images and so on. The the math is pr pretty uh, different, but pretty similar. Um, this is just where one of the things that works very well. And uh, I might also talk in the future go on to like generative networks and and other uh, tasks that you can use these things for. Um, <coughs> okay, so then let me point out this, uh, if you uh, search on um, on YouTube for uh, free blue, warm brown and his deep, le deep learning series, he has like four or five videos on exactly what we're going to do today. So here you, he talks, um, uh, also about uh, the book content and um, has some images uh, regarding neural networks and he has some animations where you can see how the, the one activation triggers the one in the next layer and so on. Um, and he talks about stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and then the last video and the fourth video also uh, says some words on the back propagation and uh, this derivative taking, although there's no code. Um, and then one more thing, uh, apart from uh, me telling you to subscribe, of course, to uh, my channel, there is also a video I did a year ago or so on the sigmoid function or similar functions, which are like the step functions. They go from, they are pretty flat on the one side and then they uh, do a, a smooth step and then go to another value. And these will also show up in, in, in this video because, um, so the, the, the math of how you pass from one activation to the next is actually pretty simple. Um, you have all these weights that I talked about, right? The, the parameters you want to tune, they are going to be associated with the connections and the, the biases with the, the neurons themselves. And you take the values that, that make for an activation of a previous layer and combine it in a linear fashion or a thin linear fashion with the Wait, you will see the uh, algorithm in a second. Um, but uh, then what is also done, and I will not dwell on uh, why and how and how you can extend this for this, I would say read the book, but the, the output of this linear, uh, you know, simple math function is then piped into this uh, sigmoid function, which makes it to something which is closer to a binary yes, no decision, right? Either on the one side, uh, of the sigmoid function, then it makes a step like for negative values says no, 
you could say, um, and then goes up and uh, takes an up another values, another um, like these Boolean extremes that are uh, smoothly interpolated uh, in this network. So this is why we need there uh, the sigmoid function and have a video on that. I will shortly say, um, tell you some, some pr properties of the function that we're going to use um, just to have a better feeling about it. So, okay, this, the function that we're going to use, the sigmoid is one over one plus and then e to the power of minus z. Okay, why does it work? Why, does it, why is this a, a step function? Well, so imagine z is some huge value, let's say 9001. Then we ha would have e to the power of minus 9001. So e to the power of minus something is very small. So eventually this would go to zero. So for very big values on the left hand side, this would be one divided by one plus something. So it's barely like, it's just under one. So this is an argument for why for very big values, this will go to one. Um, on the other extreme, if this set is very small, like minus 20,000, then we would have one plus uh, one divided by one plus e to the power of minus minus 20,000, right? So this would be one over something huge. And so this goes to zero, right? So we know that on the left hand side, this goes to one on the, uh, on the right hand side, it goes to one on the left hand side, it goes to zero. And in between, well, if you plug in zero, like for Z, then we have one divided by one plus and E to the zero is zero, uh, is one. So if you plug in Z equals one, then you get one half. So you are actually at this point. So the blue line is, goes from one through one half to zero. And the nice thing about these functions, about, uh, about this function apart from being a step function is, that it has a very simple uh, derivative. So if you compute the derivative, you know, the exponential function is, is easy to take the derivative of. So this actually turns out to be like, the, if you call this function sigma of z, then the derivative of this function is actually sigma of z times one minus sigma of z. So the, the derivative of this function is actually just an algebraic expression, a very simple algebraic expression um, of the function itself, just a quadratic one. Um, and here's to motivate, I also plotted uh, the function one half plus z divided by four, uh, which uh, makes it believable that the derivative of this function of the blue line is at zero is one half, uh, one fourth, so one, one fourth, the value is one half, the, the slope is one fourth. And so uh, it's clear that the, the derivative uh, of this function of the blue function will be something like the red function, right? Here we see this is very flat, here we see this is very flat, so this goes to zero, it goes to zero. But in the middle, the, the derivative is one over four, so this is 0 0.25. And so eventually it must go from zero to 0 0.25 uh, five to zero again, so it makes this kind of bump and this is a little bit like a Gaussian. And if you do the math, then you will see, oh, the derivative of this function is just the, this algebraic expression of the function itself. And this is something that, that helps uh, making this this uh, implementation of the neural network just have, I don't know, 50 lines, right? Because of course, if you want to implement the gradient descent, if you want to compute where it goes up, you have to take the derivative, if you have to find out where the slope is. And the fact that this step function, step function of, of some other linear terms, has such a nice der derivative makes the ch chain rule easy to apply. You just, um, whenever you have to take the derivative of this function, you know, oh, I yeah, just take the function and, multiply it with itself and sub, uh, subtract itself, blah, blah, blah. And this small algebraic um, expression, and then you can write down a closed formula essentially for all the layers. And then you, the back propagation amounts to propagating this derivative back and applying this the chain rule um, to this function and linear functions. And that's why it looks so concise in the end. That, that's the surprising thing. And, and generally, it is surprising in a way that, that this simple algorithm uh, allows us to learn stuff. Um, and this is, in, 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 to some extent, uh, discovered by a lot of trial and error, um, the, the insight that you can actually do the simple calculus to um, solve this kind of discrete program of, uh, problem of, of, uh, of labeling. Um, and if you look into the book and the last uh, 
sections then there are some some more motivations uh, that show why we can at least expect that su such an algorithm amounts to being able to approximate any function and uh, again I, I might go into some literature on uh, um, motivating why this and these things work and this and this not uh, but now that we uh, have like covered the basics of the idea let's actually do some coding I would say okay so here we're going to do our coding um, let's print hello world just to get started um, here is my terminal that you already saw let's clear this um, and I can do Python and then network one dot pi and it will print hello world okay that works um, in this folder I have this network this file this is empty yet then I have downloaded uh, the all the, the images um, and then also there is the the code that already works that I just ran before where you saw how the network trained and so on and so forth um, and I will um, not force you to um, to uh, watch me code the you know the, the loading functions all these things so I will just discuss uh, the actual coding of the network so um, let me actually um, give me one second Okay, um, so let me actually just copy paste this over. Just the, the things that are um, that are uh, just you know we have to load the the data and we have to format the data a little bit. Uh, I will describe the code, but I will not actually do the the live coding of it. So let me start by checking if that works as intended. Okay, hello world, and yeah, okay, so. Uh, I will also put this in GitHub somewhere. These are the, the links I just walked you through. Um, these are, if you're interested, these are the topics, um, a selection anyway, of the uh, things that are discussed in the book uh, beyond the first third of the uh, discussion of the first neural network that I do not touch upon in this video. So there are some things like, you know, clever initialization of weights and biases and how you can actually you know not take a the, the simple difference between um, predicted and desired output to to define the cost function the, the stuff that is to be minimized and then there are some tricks on how to, to tune and the network or some, use some other functions uh, to make it worth nicer uh, and then also as I said discussion of external libraries and use of external libraries um, this is all in the book, uh, not touched in the video, but now you know what you're <laughs> what you're missing out. Um, it's mostly just improving the the, the, the the gist of it, the steepest descent um, uh, algorithm and the basic the basic uh, idea of the architecture, the basic you know network that I described in this graph with the connections is, stays the same. <clears throat> okay. Um, as I said, I use the NumPy uh, library, but this is mostly just to be able to use write functions like you know exponential functions that are also applicable to whole arrays, so that I don't have to do so much indices games and matrix computations. So no magic there. Um, we have to uh, hard code some facts about the particular uh, data that I, I use. You know this mnist, uh, this modified um, M, uh, nist handwritten images so the, the modification amounts to like putting it down to this 28 times 28 pictures so that it's uniform so that we can actually apply it to our network and so on um, and some more I mean you can read this uh, in more detail on the Wikipedia page but as you probably know uh, these neural networks are applicable like, in a magical way almost to a lot of things so we are going to uh, be able to recognize all digits so there are 10 digits the, there are some hard-coded facts about the, the size of the image uh, 28 and uh, the pixel 
number is thus the you know 28 by 28 which turns out to be i think 784 Oppa. um and then uh, to make my code a little bit stand out a little bit and uh, be prettier than, than what you find also on, on the GitHubs, uh, I, I do some basic things like I, I define an, an image class, which is just a wrapper for the type of data that we are loading from the uh, MNIST database. So this um, we're not going to see uh, much of this uh, in action apart from me accessing the members. So an image will con uh, consist of this 784 um, pixel values. Um, I access them with dot pixels. And then also with the database comes the ground proof to so the integer that says what this image is actually uh, supposed to be. And we use that to judge whether the network uh, did a good job or not. Um, then I wrote this function that you already saw, like I, I'm able to uh, print the, the image as an ASCII image, um, you know, I randomly chose some uh, thicker and thicker ASCII characters and I, I print this uh, bounding box and then I go through the pixels, which is just a, 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 a NumPy array of uh, some, some float values between zero and one. And then I map the zeros and one to some index and then I take the corresponding ASCII value and then print it out and then I say whether or not this uh, prediction uh, that can be passed as an optional argument actually uh, corresponds to the ground proof that was also passed with the image and so on and so that's how the the, the plotting works and uh, then I have three simple math utility functions so on the one hand the, the sigmoid right one plus e to the power of minus z and this whole thing to the power of minus one uh, then the derivative, which I argued uh, is just a sigmoid times one minus it itself. And then finally, uh, there's a small utility function that I use with NumPy. Um, so if this is an array of, of arrays of different sizes, then this function returns an, an array that has the same shape or shape as this array of arrays, um, but initialized with a bunch of zeros, right? So we're just going to use this in before some for loops to to get some some arrays that um, are of the right sizes. And then I know I'm not going to dwell on that. This is the the load function. This is a variation of the load function I pointed to in the GitHub. Um, I'm si already sitting in the correct uh, folder. There's this file with this name. I use this um, you know zip library and I load it. Uh, this loads the training data, the test data, and then also some validation data that we're not going to use in this video. And then um, I do some formatting. This is according to uh, what they also do on the, the GitHub in the other repos. Uh, it doesn't have to interest you. In the end, I translate it to this format with the, like I wrap it in this image class so I can access the pixels and the ground proof. Um, okay, so uh, as you see here, I load the data. And just to give you a feel, I will also um, show you now um, the <laughs> how the array uh, that we load this data looks like. I'm just doing this so that you uh, that is clearer to you later when I, I actually use the data, um, what I'm accessing and so on. So let's say I have some index. Uh, in the example, I chose uh, 98. It's some random index. Um, then you know, the, 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 for example, the training data is an array of thousands of images, like 50,000 actually. And um, we can define an example image as the training data at this position. So out of this 50,000, I take just one example image and then I can print some facts about it, you know. So, so I can, for example, start by printing the the length of this thing and then also the length of the image itself like this one image let's do that okay loads it and then it prints what do you do um ah, example image dot pixels right um so this is just uh, this member here So 
So we have 50,000 images in total for the training set and the, these are 784 pixels and this is per image. Um, if I were to, let's say, uh, print the pixels here directly, um, what do I get? Well, um, these are the 784 uh, images, uh, pixel values. These are some values between zero and one. Most of them are actually zero. And then um, these are the, the values as floats that are translated to the ASCII image. So if I, of course, just look at these uh, 700 something uh, values, not so informative, but uh, that's the reason why I actually wrote this ASCII uh, function. This is actually also not part of um, the, the book or something. I just coded it up for myself. Um, but I called this, you know, image as SC and here if I pass it uh, the image and you can make a prediction let's let's guess it's uh, an 8 if I do that um, oops the image is of course example image <coughs> so then it prints it like that uh, and my guess was wrong right it's actually a free so that's all the magic of this data set. The test data set is the same thing. Um, yeah, beyond that, of course, there's also the, the actual truth value associated with it, right? If I do ground truth, then it will also print what it actually is. I mean, that's also already happening in this ASCII function, right? Come on, what are you doing? Um, ah, I want to print, sorry. So it prints out, oh, this is actually a free. The ground truth comes with the data set. Okay, um, so all that said, uh, let's actually get into it. So I will give a skeleton first. We have this class, which is called network, right? And the network uh, to be initialized will be fed some um, architecture. So you have to pass self in Python and then the hidden layer sizes that will specify what, what kind of uh, network we actually want. And so before I um, uh, go on to implement it, you know, if I don't want to implement it yet, the right pass, I show you how we will actually end up using this. So we will define uh, the hidden layer sizes and we were going to use just one layer. So it's, it's going to be a list of just one integer and this will be the number, let's say 30, right? So this um, encoding uh, amounts to this image. Uh, in this case, they use 15 neurons. I mean, I can also set it to 15, but the example so far I used 30. So uh, this is how we were going to end up encoding the hidden layers. Uh, if I would want to like more layers, like one layer with 15 and one with 30 and then one with 15, I can easily like do this by going like this uh, as we will implement in a second. So this would be some other network architecture. Um, and we're going to define an instance of the network by just passing these architecture specifications, right? Um, so let's go down to 30 again here. Um, so this is how we're going to set up the, the network. Let me actually check if this already works. Like, so I can run it, it loads the data, but then nothing happens. Um, Ah, okay, and I need to write an initialization function, of course. Okay, so uh, before I go on, I will also, you know, do write down all these dummy dummy functions that we have to implement. So the network will need an initialization uh, init function that we pass the self to. Uh, oh, I'm stupid. So this is actually the arguments of this initialization. So. Um, this is going to be implemented, then we're going to implement the feed forward uh, function, the method that actually, you know, you give it some input and then it propagates the information throughout the network and then gives you the output. And 
to this, uh, apart from self, we have to pass the data that we want to make a guess of. Uh, then I write a predict function, which is um, predict, which is mostly just a wrapper uh, for the, the feed forward. Except here we, we also say something about whether or not it was successful. So I will also pass the, the image and then also give it the option to print out the data uh, as an ASCII and so I have this show flag. Uh, and then finally, we're going to implement the um, stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So I call this run stochastic gradient, gradient descent. And this is going to have a lot of arguments, na namely the number of iterations uh, that we're going to train. These are the epochs. Then the batch size. So this is going to be uh, one parameter that defines how the the, the small gradients are added together to make for bigger steps. Um, then the step size, essentially the eta parameter that's going to be multiplied with the negative gradient. And then the, the training data, training data, and also optionally the test data. It's not going to be necessary to train, but if you want to see how well it performs during the training, as you saw with the percentages, then we need to pass this. Okay, <coughs> so um, let me try to run this and see if I have no Python issues. Okay, so far so good. So how are we going to use that? Well, we are going to take a network that we just set up and then do the run. And this takes a lot of parameters, so I will also hard code this as constants here. So I have epochs, let's say three epochs or four if you want. Um, then the mini batch size. This is the number of images per batch that I use to, you know, to fragment the, uh, the, the gradient into smaller parts. And I chose 20 here, but you know you can also do 10, I think is what's used in the book. Um, um, yeah, let's go with 10, I guess. And then eta, and it can be three or something bigger, uh, also correlates with the, with the batch size in the end, because both of those define uh, the length eventually of, of the small uh, fractionated uh, gradient, as you will see in the algorithm. Um, but I just take the value from the book here as well. And well, and, and all of those are, ought to be arguments for the training. So this and training data and also test data. Okay. I will regularly check if everything is syntactically correct. Okay. So now he runs this, but for now, you know, it just it does nothing. Um, and so after this is done, we're going to iterate through some test images to just see how well it performed like uh, by ourselves. So I say for some other, uh, other index, um, in, and then some random indices. And I also want to use it the same, uh, first that I used above. So I will start with, sorry, come on. So what this will do is it will first test the sum index that I uh, defined above um, here. So this is this is going to be used, um, and then so seven other indices are going to be used. And with all of those, um, I'm going to get out the corresponding image that I'm interested in, and then do the prediction on it. And show, show that true. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So far, so good. <clears throat> so. 
The first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually take the hidden image layer sizes and set up the data structures that we're going to optimize. So we're going to set up the array of a bunch of weights and a bunch of uh, biases that are optimized during the stochastic gradient descent run, right? And so going back to this image, so we have weights associated um, with uh, going from one layer to the next, so with these connections, and then also for each, what I will call um, out layer, like each uh, layer that gets an output from a previous layer, so this is going to be an quotes unquote out layer. Um, we also have some biases associated with them. And uh, then um, that means that apart from the hidden layer, we also have to code up this output layer. This is going to be a, of size 10 and the input layer is going to be of size 784, right? So um, in the initialization, I speak of uh, out layer sizes and these are going to be well, it's going to be the hidden layer sizes, but then also uh, this uh, the layer at the end that's not hidden, but it's the output layer with 10 elements. Uh, I could also do length of digits, of course, here. Digits, you know, if you, if you uh, go up, the digit was just range 10, so this is also just 10. Um, oh, where am I? Okay. And so, whoppa. And so the biases are going to be some uh, array of NumPy arrays. Uh, and they are going to be initialized in our case on, to some random values. You know, before I actually do an optimization, I set myself to a random point in, in the space. And so I use the NumPy random function and there the, are the normal distribution actually. So I do rand n and these um, are going to correspond to the sizes of the output layer. So for all the for all the neurons, for each neuron that is the has a value computed as uh, as as out value from some functions stemming from previous layers, um, we initialize a random value here, and then we have to do the same thing with the with the biases. So we're going to have a uh, with the weights. So we're going to have a weights uh, structure as well. And for that, we need all the layers and how they are connected. And there's some convenient ways uh, that you can do that in Python. So I will actually set up the in layers as well. So there have, has to be one input layer with pixel size. So this pixels, if you remember, was uh, the number 784, image width squared, um, and plus the hidden layers, right? So this is just a pendant to above. And similar to what we did with the weights, uh, with the biases, the weights are, we're going to use this uh, normalization, um, normalized distribution initialization. And so these are now corresponding to these weights and we are also for each pair of layers. So this is one pair, this is one pair. And if the network would be bigger, you know, we have even more pairs of, of subsequent layers. <coughs> we have to create a, a data structure holding bunch of uh, randomly initialized values of the correct sizes, right? There are so many connections. And um, in Python, you can do that as follows quickly. Um, we're going to have the sizes and the star just means taking the pair and uh, putting it as an argument to a function which takes several arguments. But this is just to avoid this, this comma, essentially. Um, for sizes in and now I have to pairwise zip up the, the all the layers and I already have this structure so I can just go with zip output and input uh, in their sizes so so what this does is when you, you see that the out uh, the output uh, layer sizes and the input layer sizes both know about the hidden layer sizes and the one of them has the final output layer, one of them has the initial input layer. And so they are here shifted by one and all this line does is like matching them up correctly pairwise um, so that I capture the dimensionality of all the connections and I get the right number of weights. 
So I will not write on that too much, but you can imagine. Like you can also do a little bit hard coding and, and find out how many combinations and weight, uh, connections there are. But in Python, we can solve this very elegantly in this case. Okay. <coughs> So going on to the feed forward algorithm. So this is the algorithm that we pass the data. The data is going to be this, in this case, a uh, array of pixel values. Um, and this array will make for the first activation. A here stands for activation. Activation. Uh, we initialize it on, on the data itself, right? The first layer is going to be 784 uh, numbers and the, the activations will exactly correspond to the to the pixel values, the grayscale values. Um, and what I will do in the end is this feed forward function will, will return uh, everything that happens on the whole uh, network. So I create two uh, structures that I will return. One of them is a list of all the activations, but I cannot write A's. I usually I would write A's um, for a list of A's. <laughs> uh, but S is already a keyword in Python, so I have to do, uh, call it something else, so I call it ace underline. And this is going to be a list of activation and, you know, and it starts with the, the A that we already know. And then there's going to be an intermediate value, a sets um, in the computation. And this is also going to be a list closely associated with the activation. So what do we do? We say for all the weights and biases in, in this uh, zip of weights and biases, self weights, self biases. So we set, we, we um, pair up uh, going through all, through the whole network from, from left to right on these images, or like from, from left to right on, on these graphics. I'm going to take uh, the weights here and, and uh, the biases corresponding to this out uh, layers and the formula um, that is also described in the book. I mean, I can, if I quickly find it. So let me remember this page 50. So this is basically this formula. So we take the, an activation from some layer here called a minus one, um, then apply all the weights. This is a matrix of weights corresponding to the connection to the next layer, adds the biases. And then we have this kind of, uh, this is linear, a thin linear a value. And then this is squeezed into the sigmoid function, right? The, it, whatever comes out there is, 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 is smoothed up into this step. And this will be the, the value of the next activation. So here are some activations. Um, we're going to, from the surrounding weights and biases, in the, in the you know, correct way, according to the book, uh, compute and uh, for each of those numbers, another number. And this is then going to be the activation that is in the same fashion used for the next layer. And so in this way, the activations propagate to this, to, for this simple sort of brain and go from the pixel inputs to a prediction output. Okay, so here, uh, again, the multiplication of the weights with the, with the activation uh, of the layer and then adding, just adding plus B, B is the biases and then squeezing it into the sigmoid and then we have the value of the next A. This is what we're going to implement. So what do we do? Um, well, this is what this, uh, this linear aspect, this is what is going to be called Z and this is the product here and then plus B. Okay. That's the first part. And then the activation is going to be the sigmoid of this sigmoid offset. That's that easy. Um, and then, you know, we can also, we'll save uh, the, the data as the information propagates by appending this information here. You know, a, the value of a changes for each uh, like sequent sequential layer and all these values are appended to this list and similar with the sets also going to be appended. Um, and finally, we can make a prediction, namely the prediction is going to be, you know, uh, at the end image propagates further, all the output uh, neurons are activated and we're going to um, interpret the 
the label associated with the neuron that fires the strongest, where the value is the biggest, as the prediction, right? So uh, let's say here we input an, an image of the number three, and then we will have uh, some activations on all of them. And what we want is that, that on this one, on the third, the activation is the highest, like it lights up the, the most, the number here ending up here, the activation here is the biggest. Um, so once we are through with the feed forward that I just coded up, we're going to look at the last layer. Um, so the last A, the last activation. Um, and then um, take uh, from this, uh, last layer, the neuron that is has the biggest value, that has the highest activation. So this is NumPy argmax of A, right? This is our prediction. And then we're done with this function. We return all of the information we have uh, collected. Um, prediction. Okay, let me check the syntax. Uh, okay, sizes. Mm, for size in output layers. <coughs> okay. He doesn't complain, it's good. Um, okay, the, the predict function is just a wrapper where I don't fade it, the, the pixels, it, you know, the data, I could also call this pixels. Pixels. Um, but uh, actually also do a comparison against the, the image. So what is going to happen here, I uh, will just compute um, the feed forward, but with the image pixels data. And so I will get the information what happened during the run, uh, but I actually don't need all of those. So if uh, there's a Python convention um, and also in other languages where if you don't need a variable that's returned, you uh, make it into this blank. Um, I don't like it too much. I, I usually just do blank and then still put the variable name there so I know what's going on at least. So we're not going to use A or uh, sets or even A's. We're just interested in the prediction. So we're going to return the prediction, but also whether the prediction was correct. So. The, the boolean prediction equals image dot ground truth. So if the prediction uh, is, the, is the right number sa saved in the data, then this is going to return true, otherwise false. Uh, also, if we have this show set to true, then I also want him to to um, make this sc image, image as sc of this image with the prediction, right? Okay, so that's the predict function. Let me just check. Feed forward is not defined. What are you talking about? Um, okay, self. <coughs> okay, uh, and now he already does the prediction, right? Because I, I told him at the end to do the prediction. The prediction function is now already existent. Um, so what does it do? I have not yet implemented the training algorithm. So what, when I set up the network here, he just sets all the weights and biases to some random values. So he make, makes a prediction based on those. Uh, and let's look what it does. Well, here's a seven. Um, this is the last value in this, in this eight training data set uh, images. And he predicts it as zero. And, and it, as you can see, like typically, if you just put some random values, then you will be very opinionated in a very certain direction. So this is a two, but he thinks it's a zero. This is a three, but he thinks it's a zero. Basically, he thinks that most of the things are a zero. Or here is a four, and he thinks it's an eight. It's like it has, uh, obviously, he has a, a strong bias thinking most of things are zeros. Aha, uh -huh, this three is a, a one, apparently. This three is an eight. Well, actually, if we run this again, then since you should uh, resample the random values, then he will do the same thing again and do, take another uh, like bunch of missteps. So the seven is something a three, a three, this two is a six, this three is an eight. Well, he is very funky this time. Uh, nine, a lot of things are nine. Um, the three is a three, right? So he has a little bit of a bias for three, like he, he predicts some things are threes. And when it's actually like, the, this is funny, the, the threes are not predicted as three. <laughs> Coincidentally, um, but this uh, 
this free is actually predicted in the right way because it just happens to be free and he's has the right bias. Okay, so you see how that works if you don't train. So the only thing that remains uh, in this video is to code up the stochastic gradient descent. It's not that hard actually. So, okay. <coughs> um, so what we're going to use uh, for the, the iterations of training is the gradient. And for the gradient, um, we batch all of the training data into the small batches of batch size. I think I wrote 10 or 20 or something, right? 10. Um, and so we have to compute this batch gradient. This is a gradient of a, a bunch of images. So I will define a function called define batch um, gradient, I guess. Um, and this is going to get the, the batch. And it's auto return the, the gradient. So it, it, this will return, um, yeah, the, um, how did I call it? Um, del v and del uh, b. So this is, uh, del is like the derivative, uh, or I could also, like I think in a book they write nabla, I could also, like, I could go with nabla, or I could also go with gradient, but this is also long, so I will just go with del here. Um, okay, um, initialize this as none for now. Well, to compute the batch gradient, we are also going to need the, the gradient of simply with respect to one image, right? So um, maybe I should say one word on that. So um, we have now the setup for the network and we can um, we can feed it an, an image and the activations propagate through it through this you know functions that we coded up and then there's an activation and it makes some prediction based on the parameters. Um, what we want to do is again we're let's say in the stage we have just initialized it with random values and we feed it the first image we give it an image something comes out like the, the activations are all like roughly one half or something like that but we actually fed it, uh, let's say, a free, and uh, we want the best outcome for this particular image would be that on the output nodes we have zero, 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 if we want to uh, zero, one, two, and then on free there should be one because it's actually a free. That's the ground truth. It should fire like this is hundred percent correct, and the rest like four, uh, four, five, six, and so on they should all be zeros again, right? But it will not be that. What we want is to be whatever he predicts minus this array, the ground proof array, let's say, like the difference between those, the delta between those, the prediction and the actual ground truth to be as small as possible. So we're going to take this function, the, the delta function, and take the derivative with respect to to these values, right? But the, uh, and then we can tweak, we can go step in the right direction with the, um, with the weights and biases, um, and then we would have a network that is perfect on this particular image, or much better. Um, but we want the thing to work for all digits and all the, these inputs roughly well, so we have to kind of average over the, the performance. And it, it should also <coughs> not overfit, it should not actually just work for um, the, the training Im uh, images. So part of the magic in uh, the neural network design is also like to make it not just work for the this training set, but also like generalized to other images. In this case, we have the training data set that it should still work on there, even if it has never seen these digits from the from the test data set before. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do is is to do this 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 batch gradient where we say, oh, we'll take ten images at a time, compute the gradient um, for all of these ten, and then give the the, the average gradient like the, the thing that works. Uh, on average the best for, for like taking into account all of the, those 10 and this will be then one update and we were going to do this for the whole uh, uh, training data set so this, in these blocks of 10 and this will amount to one epoch of training and we can do training more and more and more to improve and better and better um, see how, how we get there okay so my point in this was actually just like uh, the, the batch gradient is is an average gradient over a bunch of images, so to speak. And so for this, we need another function. Like we already have, will define the batch gradient within the, the, the run function, but here we also need the image gradient. 
gradient. Okay, and this will take an image. So, um, and also this will return also like a gradient if we will, but and to not confuse me, myself too much, I will call this db, dw and db. Uh, Okay, define so. Okay, yeah. Um, so, and once this is done, you know, this is arguable if you want to do this do this style uh, of like defining functions within functions. In this case, it doesn't really matter much. Could also uh, code them up here. Then I would have to do more selfs, I guess. And, and so, in this case, since we're only going to use this function in this function, that's okay. And we're going only going to use this function in this function. Okay, let's not discuss this style too much. I didn't breed over it too long. Um, but okay, once we have that actually, then we're going to take this, these data sets uh, and we're actually going to do a local copy of that. So this is more or less a pattern thing that I don't actually want to work with these data sets themselves. I will make a copy and then I do for epoch in in um, range epochs. Uh, if you remember, this is a, a parameter that we pass in, to the, the function, and here we will do the training. Um, I will leave this out for a moment, um, and after the training is done, well, training, let's say, um, then. At each epoch, we are also doing, going to make the prediction. So prediction is going to be something. No, come on, prediction. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to apply the predict function that we coded up above to all the test data, and then we're going to uh, print out stuff. Sorry, so epoch training, then do the prediction and then print out the result, basically percentages. So, okay, this is just a scheme. Um, I'm not going to implement the, the, the image gradient actually. So what will we do? Well, um, the, as I said, we take the, the derivative of this delta of the error that we want to minimize with respect to all the hundreds of, uh, uh, weights and, and, and biases. So there's going to be some math and the, the, the result, the error that we know at the end of the run, right? So we start actually at the end and we uh, compute all the derivatives by doing, applying the chain rule in, in effect and going back. Um, so this is why it's called uh, the back propagation and that's why we have to start uh, actually at the end. So we say, well, the last layer and with the ground truth, um, this is basically the ground truth value, but uh, this is just an integer, and so we have to cast it to the suiting array. And um, I mean, this is just an implementation detail, but we're going to make a NumPy array uh, based on um, an array that is one exactly when the, um, the value in the range 10 is the ground truth value, right? So we're going to go through all, like from the top to bottom in, in this image, we're going to go through this and check, hey, is the ground truth value zero? Yes, no, uh, zero, yes, no, zero, yes, no. And then over if the ground truth value happens to be three and, and we're there, then we say, oh, this is actually the right value, then make it one, otherwise make it zero. And so this is exactly what is achieved here. And then in, also in this NumPy arrays, you have to wrap them into another uh, list of just a tuple of one element. So this is just the translation, okay? Nothing interesting going on here. Well, we have to make the prediction actually, uh, but this this time we are actually interested in what's going on in during the, um, during the run. The last run is also, like the, this A is of course the last element here, so don't need that. Mm. And Further, uh, we are now going to initialize actually those properly. So uh, what are those? Well, here we're going to use this function that I have defined above, right? 
this init with zeros um, on the one hand for the weights and on the other hand for the biases. Okay. And then um, we start the computation of the derivative. So we start at the last layer in Python, you can say the index is minus one, that will take the last element of an array. Uh, the delta that um, I need to compute is the difference between the, the a's, well, I can actually, don't need this here. Ah, yes, I do. The a's um, at the layer L, so this is the, the activation of the last layer, right? So this is the, the last a minus, um, and then the ground truth is just this. This is going to be done for each image. Um, and then if you look at the implementation, you know, again, the second chapter uh, in this book is all about uh, how do you like bit the, the difference and take the derivative off and um, wh what you have to do, take the derivative of with respect to, you know, A and Z and so on. So this chapter is all about the calculus. It's, it's pretty basic math, but it's just uh, playing around with a bunch of indi indices and implementing uh, these equations and see here's the, here's the error. Um, okay, so I, I'm not uh, going to explain this, but uh, here you have to the sigmoid of the last set. So, right, so this is going to be the delta. Then um, once we have that, we can add for the last weights the value. And what is this? Well, here we have to do some, some more numpy, the dot product um, between this delta that we just computed. And then since the weights connect to the last activation, we have to do the this activate, like the one before the last one, uh, we go to the second to last. Um, and then this happens to be a dot product where we have to compute the transpose. So this is math implementation details, right? So same thing for the uh, for the biases. They happen to sit exactly on uh, on, the, on the the layers. So this is just the data itself. And then we do the same thing. Uh, we go now from the end, from the last layer, where we computed the delta back. So for L in range, and this starts at the second to last one, goes down to to the zeroth one, which is the second, the last one minus, and then there's one for exactly each of those, right? So these are, we are already sitting on one layer and then there are uh, the number of layers that remain are exactly the amount of uh, layers that have biases. And then min minus one means you go uh, back for a loop from the, like you go in the negative direction. And for each step that basically looks like that. We'll have to make some adjustments here. So um, here in this dot product, um, we are interested in, okay, I will just, you know, I will not go into many explanation mode here, but this is the, basically just translating the formulas that we that you have in the book. Take the weights, um, on this index, uh, but we have to go in the other direction again, and then to compute the dot product to the transpose. Um, and that is done with the delta from, from uh, the pre previous iteration, and then also multiply it with the sigmoid. Um, and here, <coughs> sorry, this is the same, and this is also the same. So this is we done here, I think. Let me just check. It's of course easy to make an, uh, a small error here now, uh, but it looks good. And then we return. And this is the image gradient. And this is this is basically the chain rule for one image going through the whole network from uh, end to t uh, to start. And so now we can do something quite similar, but for a batch. You know, now we're in the batch, batch gradient functions. So what is this going to be? Well, we're also going to initialize uh, the same structure here, but now this is going to be some sort of average. Um, 
So, well, this is very simple. Simpl uh, simple. So for dv db uh, in like for these kind of uh, individual image gradients. So map image gradient and batch. The batch is what I pass here. Batch of images. Apply the image gradient to all of those loop through those and then update oh, let me see like add the whatever you get here um to the like averaged gradient so here i want to cross this not even to a numpy array but eventually uh just add the dw Right. So here we're going to to add up all the contributions from the from the individual images to to this batch gradient, uh, and in the end we also have to normalize. So we have to divide it by ten in this case. So I will take this and divide it by the batch size, and the same thing for the DB. So and this is the batch gradient, right? Obvious in a way um, and we're done with that that's very great uh, what is left to do well we do the training now uh, as I said the stochastic aspect comes into play by randomizing the, the sequence in which the images are fed to the network so we do random shuffle and then we're going to shuffle this training data which just mixes up the positions of the images within this within this collection then for i in range zero. So now we go through the batches um, and we do this for all images. So we go in batch sizes of 10 in our case. The mini batch um, that I spoke of is going to be training data from this index where we add to the index plus plus this batch size and so this is the batch the batch of 10 images then well we apply the gradient the batch gradient to this and get out um you know how, how should i call this um, normalized gradient So, uh, and this is then used to update the, the weights. It's pretty much it. So we take the weights, uh, we update them by going in the negative direction of the gradient, right? And we go a step uh, size of eta. Is this the same thing for the biases, right? So this is the negative sign comes from going the other direction. So we are here now, right? Um, so we computed where, where is this, the, the batch gradient is like a sort of average in which does it go up, then we turn around, go in the other direction of that, and with like a step size of three, in this case in our setting. Um, so, and then we do this for all epochs, and then uh, the, the thing is trained, and that's it. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the artificial intelligent magic, right? Optimizing on some, on some, on some, on some test data. Uh, we make the prediction then at every epoch we define a score the score will be well uh, the prediction is is a boolean right so where do we have the prediction here whether or not the prediction fits with the ground truth data that is provided with the image data so the score like overall uh, images we're going to sum up oh and i only have seven minutes <laughs> before my uh, seven percent of aku before i run out of energy so let's make this quick um I sum over the booleans. Uh, in Python, you don't have to distinguish between uh, true and false and uh, one and zero. So I can just take for all these pairs that are returned by the prediction, the first, com the, the, the second component of this pair for pair in these predictions. This is the score. The total number is, of course, just the length of the test data set. And then 
uh, the percentage, how well it uh, performed, is going to be, well, the score divided by the total. And if you want to be on uh, times 100. And if you want to be on the safe side, then you divide actually the float, because this will come out as an, an integer and then Python 2, then you will get some, some rounding issues there if you divide a natural number. Um, so that's how we do it. And we, you know, I will round this for niceness sake with two digits and print out how well we performed. So I say epoch number so and so. Uh, test data score was so and so um, out of so and so and that amounts to a percentage of so and so format um, and we pass the epoch which is uh, what we loop over here I, uh, I write actually this like that because I don't really use it in a functional manner it's not part of the algorithm just to print score total and percentage but this is all optional, right? This is optional just to see how, how well it performed. And that, my friend, should be pretty much it. I think it's all the magic. So let's collect all my, my syntax errors here. All my errors, okay. okay there we go. Um, range 10. What are you complaining about? Invalid. Ah, I always tend to forget the in here with these for loops. Image gradient is not defined. Um. Ah, gradient. Ah, I forgot the R here. My goodness. Um, so where did I write that instead of dot? Mm, okay. Don't let me wait, my friend. Ah, okay, it works. So yeah, um, it looks good. He's able to print it. He's able to train. So let's let, let this run to the end. How many epochs did I choose? Four epochs. Maybe I'm already heating up because it seems to take longer. But as you can see, um, things work. And I might have convinced you that uh, the the whole thing is basically just this implementation of some optimization. Uh, no deep magic uh, in that regard from a coding perspective. Of course, uh, as I said, there's a bunch of things in how you can improve and known techniques to improve the whole thing. And um, some I explained in the book, but there's a, of course a lot of research going on and I'm sure a lot of things will come out. This is also, of course, uh, you know, not the only approach to machine learning, um, but a big chunk and the chunk that works well in the last years. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's the magic. Uh, my network here, like he seems a little bit to be, uh, like it works, he, he improves with learning, but it's a little bit mysterious to me why he takes so long when previously it was quicker, probably just because it's running hot. Okay, yeah, so uh, I've read around with this in the last days, um, usually don't get over 95%. There's some random uh, aspect to it, but I also never like try to tweak the architecture in, in a serious sense or the step size and, and all these things are pretty uh, conventional and close to the book. Um, yeah, I hope you like that. If you want to have me talk more about machine learning, uh, there are some papers I would like to um, like uh, discuss that I recently read. Uh, okay, now he's finally through. Um, I expect all predictions to be fine and it looks like it. 
So yeah, um, I hope you like that. Uh, subscribe to the channel and tell me what you want to hear about more, I guess, and if this is on the right level. And other than that, uh, wish you a pleasant night.